welcome to the Heartland Connection. This is Zach Waller, the Executive Director of Hyovel, your host. Coming to you guys straight from the heartland of Israel. You may be able to hear it in the background. We're actually getting some rain here in the land of Israel. It is pouring down right now here on Har Baracha, so that is a huge, huge blessing. So thank God he is uh, sending rain to the land so that the aquifers can fill up and um, be a good year. Uh, May there be much, much more and more blessing being poured out here in the land. So that's uh, exciting news for all those of you guys who are praying for rain. Um, Rain is coming. It's here in the land of Israel. Um, So... Just a little update from us personally. We're actually headed back to the States for a little bit. I'm going to be going back there. We've got the Hebrew course that's going to be uh, kicking off here on December the 10th. And uh, so if anybody wants to sign up for that, the deadline is very soon. So hurry up and get signed up for that starting in just a couple weeks here. And then we've got the pruning just around the corner starting the first January, uh, it's coming up here very, very soon. So we're really excited about uh, that coming up. Got a bunch of guys uh, signed up already. Looks like it's going to be an amazing, amazing pruning this year. So the tour portion this week is Vayetze, which means uh, and he departed or he went out. And uh, obviously it's talking about Jacob, about Yaakov, uh, leaving his uh, family and traveling to Levan like his Ima, his mother Rivka, and his uh, father Yitzchak, Isaac, uh, blessed him to go and do. Uh, but it's really interesting, actually. Uh, this Torah portion um, basically covers this whole time where Jacob is leaving Israel. He's basically going into exile uh, leaving the land of Israel, and he's gone for about 20 years, if you calculate it up. Um, it's, he's out for 20 years, and this Torah portion basically covers what happens during that 20 years. He's At the very beginning, he's leaving, and the, at the end of the portion, he's uh, leaving Lavan and Haran and coming back to the land of Israel. So this, uh, this, uh, the, the title of this Torah portion, and he departed, is very fitting uh, for the portion because it covers this time of when he was outside the land of Israel. It's also very significant and interesting to look at this as a picture of the Jewish people being in exile um, from the land of Israel over the last 2,000 years because we see Jacob was in in exile for 20 years and the Jewish people were in exile for 20 centuries, right? 2,000 years they were gone um, outside the land of Israel. And there's a lot of parallels that you can see uh, here in Jacob's story and Yaakov's story and going out and... uh, and what the Jewish people have experienced over the last uh, 2,000 years. But now they're coming back into the land over the last, um, you know, 75, 100 years. We've slowly we started seeing this uh, incredible regathering of the people of Israel back to the land. So uh, we are in Genesis chapter 28, verse 10, uh, through chapter 32, verse 3. And we have... Jacob departing, leaving Israel for Haran, and on his way, he goes to Beit El, or Bethel, and uh, we're very familiar with this story, uh, where Jacob has his, the the rock that he, uh, you know, puts as his pillow, whatever, and then he has this vision, and um, in chapter 28, verse 11, it says, in, uh, in my translation, it says, he encountered the place. Or in Hebrew, the place is Hamakom, and um, this obviously the word is literally translated as the place. But it's um, if you if you look at all the places where Hamakom, the place, is used uh, in the scriptures, you can see it's definitely an idiom that refers to the Temple Mount. Um, it's uh, referred to in the story of the binding of Isaac that we just read. Um, it also and, and it's a lot of different places throughout the Bible. When you see Hamakom, um, it's referring to the Temple Mount, Tahar Habayit, which is really kind of fascinating uh, looking at the story um, because there's a lot of very temple, 
language going on here. And uh, so we'll just read it here in chapter 28, starting in verse 16. It says, Then Yaakov awoke from his sleep and said, Surely Hashem is in this place, and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, How awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So early in the morning, Yaakov took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up for a pillar and poured oil on top of it. And he called the name of that place Beit's El, or Bethel, which you might miss in uh, in, uh, in English, Bethel, but Beit's El, or Bethel, actually means house of God. It literally means that. Um, so then it goes on to say, the name of the city was Luz at the first. Then Yaakov made a vow saying, if God will be with me, and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and clothing to wear, so that I come again to my father's house in peace. Then Hashem shall be my God, and this stone which I have set up for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will give a full tenth to you. So we see at the beginning here saying that uh, Yaakov's like, wow, this is none other than the house of God. And what is the house of God? It's the temple, right? And then later we see him saying, okay, God, if you are with me in this exile, if you take me out uh, to, in, on this journey and bring me back to this place, then, um, you know, I, I always just remember this is, okay, this is when he instituted the tithing, right? Tithing a tenth. But that's not all, that, that wasn't his full vow. Yes, he's, he did say that. But he also says, uh, this stone which I have set up for a pillar shall be God's house. So he's basically saying, when I come back, I'm going to, um, you know, if if you bring me back, God, then I'm going to build the temple and I'm going to bring a tithe. And so I don't know for some reason I've just always missed that uh, reference here to this him talking and referring to a temple, the house of God. And it's really interesting. We might be able to get into this. Uh, more next week, but um, this vow that Jacob makes, um, it almost seems like when he comes back into the land, the next portion, that he doesn't immediately fulfill his vow and that possibly gets into a little bit of trouble uh, through not doing that. Uh, so it's interesting if you go and look, like vows are obviously a very important, very critical thing, very important thing to to fulfill. And it looks like when he comes back into land, he doesn't immediately do that. So maybe we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, next week. But I just wanted to reference that because we see the vow being made right here in this week's portion. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, the Temple Mount and some of the things that we've learned. I think, um, you know, for a lot of Christianity um, and from, uh, you know, in Christian circles, there's like not really a lot of connection to Jerusalem and the Temple Mount itself. And um, because I think a lot of people, when they hear Temple Mount, they hear Temple, they immediately think of, oh yeah, well that's where the Antichrist is going to set up his throne. And so, yeah, of course I'm not going to be, you know, excited about that or, or work towards that or, um, you know, make any effort to help this happen, He's, you know, because this is going to be the Antichrist throne. I don't want to help build the Antichrist throne. I want to be about building the Messiah's throne. And uh, but I think this is a really big misconception, and um, and has has been used as a very uh, as a tool against the Jewish people and against the place that God's chosen. I mean, we see right here, Jacob starts this thing out saying, "This is a vow that he's going to build the temple." And if you go back and look at the story of the Maccabees, you have maybe a similar thing kind of going on there, where you have a type of antichrist coming in, you know, the Greeks coming and setting up their idol of Zeus in the temple. And, um, but what did the Maccabees do? They say, oh, well, since there's a antichrist, you know, thing up in the temple, then it's no longer God's temple. It's his house. So we can't, so we have to go build something somewhere else. We have to do something different. No, they said, we have to go back in and purify the temple of God. And actually, even in the New Testament, uh, when it talks about the antichrist, it actually refers to um, the temple as the temple of God that much like the story of the Maccabees, a this Antichrist comes in, sets up um, you know his throne there, but that but that in the end the temple is taken back as the temple of God, the the holy God, the true God that we all serve. And so I think there needs to be, and I know for me personally, there's definitely been a renewing of my mind and understanding what the temple is, what it's all about, and what what its purpose is. Um 
and trying to understand, you know, what is our connection? What's our place as believers in Yeshua, as, uh, as Christians? What What is our place in this? How do we connect? And so obviously a very important thing to do is to go back and look at what what the uh, New Testament says about it, and it's very interesting. In uh, Mark chapter 11, uh, starting in verse 15, it says, And they came to Jerusalem, and he, speaking of Yeshua, he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables and the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, is it not written, My house shall be called the house of prayer for all the nations? But you have made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and the scribes heard it and were seeking a way to destroy him, for they feared him, because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. And when and when the evening came, they went out of the city. So I think for, for many believers, many Christians, they read this point and they go, Oh yeah, it was those those stiff necked, horrible you know, Jewish people there, you know, that's, that's why Yeshua went in here and started flipping over tables because he just hated the Jewish people. And he was going in there and just making a wreck of that because, you know, the Jews are just so terrible. But, uh, I think, uh, even in me just saying that, it's like, you can definitely tell that there's some major anti-Semitic, like anti-Jewish, um, thought and feeling in those words. And if you really look at it, that's not at all what's happening. Well, I mean, first off, Yeshua was a Jewish person, and so he obviously didn't hate himself. And um, secondly, why is he going in and turning the tables? And I think in even some uh, study about what was going on at this time, I mean, we, we know that there was very, very um, crazy things happening at this time in history Um in Jerusalem. There was all kinds of just horrible things that were happening. And, uh, you know, even within the leadership, there was all kinds of corruption and, uh, you know, people doing things that were not godly at all. And so we see the Yeshua's coming into the temple saying, what's happening right now in this temple, setting this up as a place of selling things in this particular location. And if you actually go and see where this was happening, the place where Yeshua did this is actually the area where where the nations, the people from the from the nations were supposed to come, and it was like their their area on the, up on the Temple Mount. And so people were taking it over as a place to sell. And he's like, no, this this place is supposed to be designated. It was like actually up on the Temple Mount. This place is designated for the nations to come. This selling, buying and selling needs to be done outside, off the Temple Mount. And we actually see that here because he's like, uh, let's see, what verse was it? Uh, verse 18, the chief priests and the scribes heard it, seeking a way to destroy them. Uh, let's see, maybe it's before that. Let's see, yeah, verse 16. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. So basically saying, you know, you could just imagine him saying, you know, because there's several different gates leading up onto the Temple Mount. So you can just imagine him, you know, telling the different disciples, hey, you go there, you block this gate, I'll block this gate. We're not going to let anybody come up here and, uh, you know, create a place where the nations aren't don't have space to come in here and be connected uh, and be able to pray right here on the Temple Mount. And he quotes Isaiah and he says, the nations are supposed to come and pray in this place. And so obviously for us, as people who are outside of the land of Israel, um, you know, as, as people who are uh, from foreign countries, um, this is a huge place for us. Like this is what Yeshua was saying. The nations need to come and pray at this particular geographical location. Uh, we also have um, the same account in, uh, in John chapter 2. Uh, verse 13, it gives us a little bit uh, more insight into what happened. It says, uh, the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Yeshua went up to Jerusalem. Obviously, Yeshua was a Jewish person. For Passover, he was going to go up to Jerusalem, just like the Bible says. So in the temple, he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there and making a whip of cords. He drove them out of the temple, drove them out with the sheep and oxen, and he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables, and he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. And his disciples remembered what that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. And so we see here that Yeshua had a zeal for the temple, for his father's house, this house that was supposed to be a house of prayer for 
all the nations. Um, I'd really encourage you guys. There's a, there's a uh, organization called Cry for Zion, and I think it's just cryforzion.com. They also have on Facebook and stuff. But uh, I would really encourage you to go and look up um, their website and and check out what they do. They've got some really really good information um, for this uh, just on this whole topic of what what is our connection as believers in Yeshua as Christians to the Temple Mount to Jerusalem. Um, there's a really good article by John Innerson called Jesus Loved the Temple Mount. And if, if you search that, uh, you'll, you'll find it. Jesus Loved the Temple Mount by uh, John Innerson with Cry for Zion. And uh, they've got a lot of really good videos and articles and different things on there that uh, will really help answer your question. Because there's a lot of other questions too, like, you know, why do we need a temple? If, uh, you know, if, you, if we believe that Yeshua came as a sacrifice, are there going to be sacrifices later when the temple's built and how does that all work and um you know there's just a lot of questions and you know we have the scripture about how the temple is inside of us and so if the temple's in us then why do we need a physical literal temple anymore and um you know several other kind of theological uh questions that we that that uh, everyone should have and be able to answer uh, on this topic and so their uh, website is a really really good resource um to go and check those things out, and and uh, and to study and find out more about um, about the uh, the Temple Mount and what our connection is to it. Um, there's also we've uh, really connected with um, Knesset member uh, Rabbi Yehuda Glick, and um, he's definitely a, a Temple Mount activist, um, and uh, he actually has a really um, good book. If you look up uh, his thing, I think it's called uh, "Arise and Ascend." Is the name of it. Um, if you look that up, it's really good. Just learning about um, what was where on the Temple Mount, and um, you know, uh, becoming more aware of this, the physical reality of what's there, uh, is so is so educational. Uh, but he has also has a website called JerusalemofPeace.com, and um, he's trying to get people to sign what he calls the uh, the Jerusalem Covenant. And basically, it's just recognizing that Jerusalem is supposed to be a city of peace, and the whole uh, reason for the temple was for people could come and pray and bring peace into the world, and it's really sad <laughs> that a lot of the nations don't realize that if they would actually allow the Jewish people to build the temple, that this would be a huge um, way to bring peace into the world. Um, but people see it as an obstacle to peace. But the reality is, this is this is the thing that will bring true peace when the, the temple is finally restored and the Messiah is able to come and rule and reign from Jerusalem. Um, so I'd encourage you to go check that out, jerusalemofpeace.com, uh, with, uh, Rabbi Yehuda Glick, and also check out his book, Arise and Ascend. Very, very educational. I'd also encourage you, I, I, uh, found a book, uh, I think it was last year, called, uh, A Temple in Flames, and, um, it was a really, really good, like, sometimes you read books like, uh, Josephus, or, and they're a little bit of a hard read, and, um, and, uh, you know, it's hard to really get into some of the details or the facts that are presented. Um, and maybe they're more just kind of really laying out details. But uh, but this book, A Temple in Flames, there's was, there was a lot of detail, but the way it was written, it was very, a lot easier to read and um, was really fascinating just uh, reading through like what the different factions were in Jerusalem and why they were, um, you know, having all these quarrels and fights and what was going on. And... Um, kind of what happened through the whole process of the temple being destroyed by the Romans. So I'd encourage you to look up that book as well, called A Temple in Flames. Um, and obviously this is a really difficult thing that happened, but I think it's really important for us to know the history, to know what happened. It helps us connect and build a yearning for its redemption, for the temple to be rebuilt. Um, I think that's something that we're really missing in the... Um, in, in the believing community and believers in Yeshua and Christian community and even in more, you know, like messianic circles, people who are actually studying the Torah and trying to learn how to, you know, keep the Shabbat or different things, um, where I think even a lot of those circles were missing this connection to Jerusalem, this connection to the Temple Mount, um, and this thing that Yeshua, the Messiah, our master, uh, was very, very passionate about and something that he was very um, obviously, you know, we don't see anywhere else in the scripture where he's like so passionate, flipping over tables and he's like, no, this is my father's house. 
And so my prayer is that we would be able to, as his followers, take on that same passion and recognize that the physical reality of this place is very, very special, the place that God Almighty chose. And, you know, as you start thinking this way, going back and looking at all these scriptures, they really come alive and you can understand so much better um, what's going on by just acknowledging that there's a reality to this physical place. And uh, obviously, as uh, as Christians, as believers in Yeshua, the other huge event that happened right there on the Temple Mount, uh, very significant to, to us, is um, when the Holy Spirit came in Acts chapter 2. Um, some people get confused and think that it happened in the upper room or whatever, but it, it actually, if you look at it closely and you uh, study the words that are used, I talked about Hamakom before the place. If you go and look at it, um, there's a really pretty clear evidence that the Holy Spirit was actually poured out uh, on the Temple Mount. Um, so you should go back and study that and look that up. Uh, but I think there's more information about that too on the uh, Cry for Zion website if you want to go and check that out. Um, but, you know, but if, it, it kind of makes sense, you know, that, that when nations are gathering, the Jewish people are there uh, on, the, on the Temple Mount and they're praying together and, you know, talks about being in one accord, you know, unifying their... Uh, it would make sense that God would pour out His Holy Spirit upon the people. So I think, you know, that's kind of another one of my prayers and my, a call to the um, believers in Yeshua, the Christian community, is that we need to get back to that place where we're recognizing the place to pray is the Temple Mount. It's the house of prayer for all nations to come and in one accord, you know, bring unity where we can come together and pray. So I, I encourage you to study into that and, and find, you know, what is um, God's will? You know, that's what that's what I really feel like it's all about. It's like, okay, God, what are you doing? What is your will? Okay, I want to align myself with that. And being here in the land of Israel and seeing what's going on, it's like, it's so clear. God is restoring the land of Israel. The redemption of the land, which leads to the redemption of the world, is happening right now before our very eyes. And so aligning ourselves with that is such a powerful, incredible, humbling thing that we can experience. Um. And we have uh, some of our guys, you know, as, as we've been connecting more, we've had some pretty crazy uh, experiences too. Even uh, over the, just this year, it seems like it's really uh, begun to become more of a thing that uh, that Hayuvel and, and all of our staff people are really connecting more to. And we're having some pretty interesting experiences. Obviously this year, um, back in the summer, they had the whole deal with the, was the terrorist act where the, um, where the policeman was murdered. And then... They set up the um, security and stuff, and then the the Palestinian people, the Arabs, kind of uh, didn't like that, and so they were, you know, boycotting the Temple Mount. They weren't going up there, so there was a lot of quiet. So we were actually able to go down with our whole group while while it was quiet on the Temple Mount, and that was a really incredible experience. Because usually when you go up there, there's quite a bit of um, the security, and then also the waqf, the uh, Arab, the Jordanian guards who are there making sure that you don't pray and making sure that you don't do all these things. And so it was a lot quieter, a lot freer when we were able to go that time. So it was a real blessing. And uh, since then, uh, one of our guys on staff, uh, Aaron Murphy, uh, had a really crazy experience through a miraculous chain of events. All of a sudden, he, he runs into a very well-known uh, Christian pastor named Lou Engel and uh, was actually able to take him on a tour up to the Temple Mount and take him around. And so it was really exciting to see, you know, in this whole idea of getting the nations connected, here's this this big pastor who, um, you know, was able to get connected to the Temple Mount and start, you know, begin to understand the importance of it uh, right there in Jerusalem with one of our staff guys. It was pretty exciting to see that happen. There was also a, a, a movie actor that came, we were able to take him on a tour up there. So it was just really crazy to see the nations connecting to the land of Israel. So thank you guys so much for listening. Shabbat Shalom from the beautiful, exceedingly good land of Israel. Restoration.